Uh, hello. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the RSA to hear Mary Midgley talk about her brilliant new book, Are You an Illusion? Um, I'm going to ask Mary um, a few questions, and I'm going to invite you to ask uh, questions. And following the event, uh, Mary will be signing copies of her book uh, in the adjacent room. Um, this is uh, Mary Midgley's first book since 2010's The Solitary Self, Darwin and the Selfish Gene. If you haven't read Are You an Illusion yet, it's an invigorating tour de force in 150 pages. Uh, she takes us from deep ocean plankton to the moons of Saturn, from the domestic virtues of wolves to the left brain thinking that killed Pliny the Elder on Mount Vesuvius. We go from Aristotelian teleology to MRI scans by way of Marie Curie, Lynn Margulis, the composition of soil, uh, 17th century automata, what was going through Napoleon's mind when he invaded Russia, and the enlarged hippocampi of London taxi drivers. Um, ladies and gentlemen, will you please join with me in giving a very warm welcome to Mary Midgley. Um, Mary, I'd like to ask by, um, I'd like to start by asking what led you to write Are You an Illusion in the first place? Exasperation. <laughs> um, with the, the doctrine go, going around for some time, largely from scientists, but also I'm afraid from some philosophers, uh, that the self is an illusion, that you aren't really there. Uh, as Crick said, you, your so joys and sorrows, your ambitions and memories and so on are just a lot of cells uh, in your mind. Well, now, the trouble with this sort of talk, it does seem to me very serious, that it distracts people from thinking about their own lives in the direct way that they can, from the data that they themselves are getting. It tells them, no, what you really need is some physical science or other, and at present it's these no, uh, the nerve cells. Um, this distraction, this notion that science ahead of everything else will solve all your problems, what one calls scientism, uh, is, has been on the increase for a long time. Um, and I think it takes the place which perhaps some sorts of theology used to take, getting in the way of people thinking about what is directly around them and sh they should be thinking about. Is that an answer, Rob? Yes, and I'll, well, in the book you say, uh, I want to, uh, it, it, something that flies in the face of current orthodoxy needs to be stated clearly. You say, minds can affect brains as well as brains affecting minds. Can you explain for us how that happens? Yeah, I would be happy to start by doing that by talking about London taxi drivers. Uh, you know some experiments done some years ago when the taxi drivers really did have to learn the whole of London by heart, found that their hippocampi were bigger than other people's. Well, you see, hippocampi are what we remember with. And it's a good test because the names of streets don't mean anything. So it's pure memory. Um, and it emerged that these people, by learning this sort of stuff, uh, were uh, permanently affecting the, their brain cells. You see, the thing that's so hard to get the hang of here, I think, is that when we think one thing is happening, but we perceive it in two ways. We perceive it directly in consciousness, but it can also be perceived by uh, people measuring the cells. The cells are doing something when we think. Um, and these aren't two separate things. It's part of the, it's, it really is the moment, the one thing. Um, and the, uh, the doctrine that matter affects mind and mind can't affect matter has been really very strong in our culture for the last more than a century. Um, 
so that it makes us very hard to understand. And uh, you see, the, not only the taxi drivers, but there are a lot of what they call biofeedbacks can be discovered. If I read New Scientist, I often come across some gadget or other which people are going to be controlling by thinking. They can control their blood pressure, you see, looking at a little graph to see where it's going. They can make their blood pressure go down. Well, this isn't the sort of thing which ought to happen, according to uh, the ideas which we were, I'm fear, largely brought up on, but it does. I should say that the, the same study also found that there's another part of London taxi drivers' brains, the amygdala, that's slightly smaller than it is for the rest of the population. <laughs> I, I, I submitted a, a paper to the science journal Nature arguing that this part of the brain is where a positive attitude towards multiculturalism is located. <laughs> no, no, they didn't publish. They didn't publish. Um, I, I, wanted, I, I wanted to ask whether you think that this idea of an illusory self has gained a following wind from the popular superstition that we are lumbering robots controlled mind and body by our genes. Well, you see, yes, because that uh, line of propaganda uh, certainly suggested that what we think of as ourselves, our joys and sorrows and so on, uh, doesn't have any effect. Uh, it's all being done by the genes. The genes, that was about 40 years ago, wasn't it? Now it's much more the, 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 the brain cells. Uh, but the story has the same bad effect, that people who have got to take decisions and <coughs> think about how they're going to live are being told it won't make any difference, really. It's all just froth on the top. Uh, this is whatever. It's fatalism, you see. Fatalism of a rather new kind. Fatalism used to involve saying there's something called fate, which is after you. But now it involves saying there are various gadgets inside you which are taking charge, and rather mysteriously, they become active selves. Uh, you yourself cease to be one, and we thought the point of that was to say that nobody could be an active self, but somehow these little things pop up as substitute um, subjects. Um, and um, does this make sense, yes? I see how it leads to a certain sort of fatalism, and, and I want to know whether the following example is on, on which side of the fence it is, whether it's on the side of minds affecting brains or whether it's a fatalism. I noticed that in nominally progressive publications, particularly in the United States, such as, say, Mother Jones, yeah. there's been a rash of articles kind of celebrating studies that purport to have discovered that Republicans and Democrats have got different sorts of brains. There's a sort of a... If you've got the MRI scan, you can see there's a left-leaning amygdala, whereas right-wingers have got a more conservatively shaped amygdala. Uh, what's going on there? <laughs> You might well ask. I mean, there's an awful lot of this kind of thing around. Um, people are suddenly told that there's an, a scientific explanation for something which they had assumed all along. Now, one thing that might be interesting about this was to say, to see whether the um, simply to hear that the scientists are observing it from another angle. But what they are obviously, these people are obviously thinking is the real cause, isn't it, is, is, in, is in this. Um, and this distracts, you see, this is the point I started from, this distracts people from attending what, to what they should be attending to when they think about right and left being people. What is the difference in their thoughts, in their lives, in their feelings, in the course of action that they'll take? Uh, the, direct, uh, the direct observation of the relevant, relevant um, goings-on uh, is pushed aside because the idea is we've now got the scientific explanation. And that idea of the scientific explanation does seem to be a superstition, really, of the kind that should be much more often denounced than it is. And then the whole tone of that book of Crick's, which I've been quoting from about, um, about you yourself, your joys and sorrows, and so on, is this very snooty, uh, I'm a scientist and you're not, uh, line, uh, which makes people feel, oh no, well, I'm not, am I? You know? uh, and what is often bad science and always irrelevant is pushed forward as being the true explanation. Yeah? Uh, 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 and that idea of a, of a single true explanation famously has sort of disastrous 
precedences and disastrous consequences. And in our own time, uh, you, in the book, you trace a link between, on the one hand, repudiating the self, and on the other hand, uh, denying our complete and total dependency on the yeah. Earth's fragile life yeah. support yeah. systems. Yeah. Uh, how does one follow from the well, other? This is very interesting. I think they are parts of the whole thing, same thing. Um, you see, if you start seriously saying my subjective feelings and so on aren't real, what are you left with? You're left with an abstract observer, aren't you? Uh, you're supposed to be, because you're talking all the science, you see, you're supposed to be a cognitive object, something that knows, knows things, um, but not connected to the things that you know. I mean, all this about uh, the human destiny and so on is out in the world. It's one of the things that you might know. But you, the knower, are not part of it. Now, if you're not part of it, you see, it's not going to matter to you very much if the whole planet gets destroyed. Uh, you see, you're not, you're not vulnerable. Uh, you're not related to uh, the other creatures and people who are going to suffer. Uh, you're outside it. And I think, you see, that in this notion of what it is to be scientific, which has really very strongly propagated for a long time. The idea that you should be detached, you see, that you shouldn't be identifying with anything that you uh, are looking at, that you, you should be, uh, uh, your, your pulse should not alter, as it were. If you have a pulse still, I don't know how you have, but <laughs> you, see, you shouldn't, be, shouldn't be moved by any of this. Um, because you are now this abstract observer, you're detached, so none of it matters. That very good. Thank you. That, that, uh, and I'd now like to uh, invite any questions um, uh, from the audience. I'll, I'll take questions uh, two at a time, and I'll, I'll preface this section with a, a line that um, James Shapiro, the great uh, Shakespeare scholar, always says at this juncture. He always says, I'll take any questions in the form of questions. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and and I'll, I'll take them... I'll take them two at a time. I'll take You're them two going at a time. Repeat them, aren't oh, no, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I'm deaf. Yes. Yeah. Two at a time, you and then you. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Midgley, do you think that this idea of self as an illusion is to some extent one of these famous English irregular verbs that nobody really, really believes that their self is an illusion, but it's frightening how easy it is to believe that certain types of other people's selves don't really exist? whether in the past it was people with different races, whether now it's people of the wrong political persuasion whose opinions can therefore be discounted or dismissed. So is there in fact an even darker ideology perhaps lurking under this than, than the one that you've genu rather generously, I think, ascribed to some of the proponents of this view? And can I take uh, one more question, gentleman in the front row there. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that attachment is ever possible. I like to propose the saber-toothed tiger test. You have someone who believes in the self, someone who, <laughs> who actually does not believe, and the saber-toothed tiger is released at the same time. I, I don't think there would be any attachment in both of the people involved in that test. Um, so, uh, the first, thank you both. Um, the first question was, um, is it a sort of a a kind of reflexive verb, when people talk about the self that doesn't exist, they actually really mean other people's selves don't exist. They never really mean their own self, and historically that's meant other races or people of other political persuasions. Uh, well, yes, I mean, I think that the self which is taken for granted as all right and still existing is the scientist's self. You know, there is no doubt about the scientists being in a position to tell you all this, and they may express quite strong views about this and that in doing so. Uh, it's, I think if I was going to pick on the minority, it's the people in the arts and ordinary uneducated people. They don't really exist. You see, I think it's quite interesting that Crick phrases this in that way, you, your Choice and sorrows and so forth don't exist. He, of course, he says at some point this is true of all of us. But if he started by saying, I found that I don't, <laughs> you see, it would have to be a different story. You can't go on from there, really. Yes, well, I, I didn't another, hear the other. Sorry, I, sorry, I, sorry. You've got a second answer here, a question here, haven't you? Second question. It was, it, it, it violated the James Shapiro rule. 
and he'd made a, a point, which he said, if you release a saber-toothed tiger and said, attack the person who doesn't have a self, and attack the person who, 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 who believes that there is a self, and just see which one they go for. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you didn't say that at all. Forgive me, to, uh, to ask again. Yes. So if there are two people, who, one of whom believes in the self, one who doesn't believe in the self, a saber-toothed tiger is released into the room with them, he suspects that neither of them would experience, believe in the detachment anymore. I think that's true. Yes. yes thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think my pricey was exactly that as well. So, um, uh, uh, yes, sir, and then yes, sir. Surely... Um, aren't illusions only too real? Uh, aren't, uh, uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll do these one at a time since, since my pricing oh, skills real. have been call, call, called into question. Aren't illusions only <coughs> too real? Well, it depends on the sort of illusion we're talking about, I suppose. Um, <laughs> you can be put in a situation where you think where you see something frightening. Uh, it actually is some show put on, uh, but of course it's real to you at the time. I mean, the idea of reality really does need to be looked at here. I don't know um, really what is meant by saying that something which we believe and work by and can live with effectively all through our lives is an illusion. And, uh, I don't know what it would be, um, but uh, the, 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 the they never, they never go into the question of the meaning of this reality. Um, so it, does, it, it remains obscure, I think, yes. Another question. Uh, is it possible that some groups of scientists are rather like your taxi drivers, in that they spend years working on a particular narrow field, say twin studies and genetics, and lose empathy in other areas? Uh, may you be a bit unfair on them in that they are a subset of people who find it hard to be different to how they are. Is this a product of specialisation? If a scientist has just worked very closely on genetics, then it's difficult for them to zoom out again and, 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 and look at things in the round. Yes, I think that the specialisation of contemporary education has a lot to do with this. Um, not only because it occupies people and they get very used to thinking of one particular department of life, but because it is deliberately inculcated very often by the people teaching them. I mean, I think that, um, I think you had a question later about saying something to the effect of, oh yes, do you think that scientists are often the very last people to fully absorb the meanings of the latest science themselves? Yes, because, not because there's anything wrong with them as people, but because those teaching them um, constantly tell them to narrow their attention to what can be officially proved, uh, not to take an interest in the sort of speculations that might touch other people. So even subjects which really one would have thought are extremely um, near to our hearts and should, should cause people to think about their own lives aren't thought about in that way. If the conscientious scientist thinks, I mustn't look away from this uh, evidence which I have to show is conclusive. Yeah, very important that, I think. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, in. Okay. Um, I'm fascinated by all of this, and the question is, why do we believe the scientists? Why are we so susceptible to, to all of this? Uh, so there's, the first question is, uh, why do we believe the scientists? I'll just take one more question as well. Um, when you speak about joys and sorrows, I love that. And um, my question is, when you're talking about the future of the planet, perhaps the two words that you might follow on with would be responsible and morality. Would you add those in? So firstly, why, why are we so uh, credulous about uh, what scientism is telling us? Uh, and, and, the, and the second question is... Oh, sorry, I do prefer one question. Just sorry, I oh, know. We should have talked about that beforehand. Okay, I'm yeah, sorry. Well, Ask your question again, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm saying that... 
physical science, which is what we're talking about, occupies the sort of position which I suppose theology often did in times past in Europe, of being the study, the study which uh, not only tells you what you need to know, but is sufficient for your salvation. You know, I don't think it's surprising if we're credulous. Um, and the sort of the, the, the sort of propaganda that goes with it often does go with um, dismissal of other ways of thinking. Now, this doesn't always happen. A lot of scientists, and particularly good scientists, are very wide in their sympathies and play violins or otherwise occupy themselves in a way that's continuous with the rest of life. But still, there are enough um, obsessives in this area uh, to make um, obsessiveness often seem the only way to salvation. And I think it's entirely understandable that a fairly bright person who gets started on that line deliberately cuts off their wider sympathies because uh, they think it isn't, it isn't professional, you see. It's amateur. Uh, it mustn't be that. Would you like to ask your question again, ma'am? Um, I, I love Uh, uh, they she you loved your uh, use of the word joys and sorrows. Well, I think it's actually Crick's use that you were it's quoting. Crick's it's Crick's use. use. But you're, you're, would you go so far as to talk about morality and responsibility as you uh, look at the future of the planet? Well, of course. I mean, if you were really deprived of your joys and responsibilities, <laughs> joys and sorrows, if you were convinced that your joys and sorrows were illusory, you couldn't proceed with the sort of moral sensibility which shows you that some things are terrible and something should be done about them. Um, our, our whole morality requires that we should be functioning emotional beings, doesn't it? Um, and active beings in the world. Um, I don't know what these people think about all that, and honestly, I don't think they think about it, if you see what I mean. Uh, they, are, they are possessed by enthusiasm for what is indeed a perfectly proper aim, the uh, pursuit of knowledge by careful, scrupulous, undeviating uh, methods. You see, the, the, um, the sticking to good logic, the uh, refusal to take in anything that isn't properly proved and so on. This is all fine. But if you think only about that, you do lose the whole horizon of the rest, of all the rest of the other things that we have to think about. Um, I mean, you see, it's quite an interesting situation here if we talk about global warming and all that. The people who are shouting and insisting that this is dangerous and something should be done are good scientists. This is strictly scientific stuff, but it is not heard by the kind of people who don't want to know about anything but their specialities or you know, the, the, the methods by which the specialities are kept. Um, I think that, uh, the difficulty is that the Climate skeptics, uh, people who just aren't going to listen to any of this, have got a worldview which tells them all this is irrelevant amateur uh, emotional stuff um, that the, uh, the people in the arts would be fussing about. <coughs> they do not uh, read New Scientist or anything more serious in that direction. They just don't want to know. And I'm naming no names. I don't have to. Um, but. <laughs> um, a lot of people, of course, not being so determined about it, but following the sort of way in which life has been going on for some time, tend to think the most serious subject of all is economics, and they don't even actually particularly know any economics, but, you know, what's the phrase? Uh, yes, it's the economy, silly. Uh, but this is, this is serious business, but talk about the state of the Amazon and such like is rather frivolous that only um, amateurs would take an interest in this. This is the worldview which um, makes things just not visible, I think. Uh, and I, I think, as I should probably keep saying, that the 
scientific notions, notions which I'm talking about are often based on bad science. And I think the, uh, the notions about what the uh, brain cells are doing, how they could be the solely responsible ones, the bad cells. I mean, they, 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 they rest on a lot of experiments and investigations, some of which are all right. But uh, in the sort of attitude that they take up to it, uh, the, the background of thought that they've got, they're going away from what you might call science. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Are we not being uh, attacking something of, of, of this, a straw man here? Sorry, thanks. I feel that the more credible scientists do not say that the brain exists and the self does not exist. They say that the brain, with its physical properties and you know, constantly exchanging matter with the, the rest of our environment, and this subjective sense of self are one and the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin. They're not saying that one exists and the other doesn't exist. Is that something you'd accept? It's perfectly possible to say that, and probably it should be said, but Crick is un deviating about this, he's saying that all these joys and sorrows and memories and ambitions and so forth are illusory. Now, if you say something's illusory, you're saying it isn't real, aren't you? Quite what an illusion of that kind would be, as I was saying, was a bit obscure. Uh, if these are things that throughout our lives surround us and uh, appear in con consistent ways um, and are not at any rate do not betray their non-existence in some way um, if that is so it's a bit odd to say that they are illusions um, you see when you say something actually is an illusion and shall we have a, um, a monster that people are seeing in some particular wood um, the people who want to say this is an illusory monster will try to examine the occasions when it appears to have appeared, won't they? And they'll make suggestions about what it might be that gave you this impression, so to speak. What is the, uh, the, the shadow or the um, unexpected movement or something? They have to show what the reality is. And then you have a, um, an optical illusion you, you see this line, and it seems shorter than that line, um, but it isn't. Uh, well, you have to look more closely and measure, and then you see something else. Now, nothing of that sort is being proposed, is it, here? Um, and I don't, see, I'm good quoting Greek because this is lively stuff. Well, there was also the New Scientist uh, edition la yeah, in yeah. last year. There was a, yeah. a, a big spare few, which was just... A uh, batch of some people saying this and saying that it is uh, apparently a necessary illusion because they've grasped that everybody always has these joys and sorrows and so forth. Uh, but what could a necessary illusion be? Uh, you see... <laughs> I mean, if uh, one... And who would be having it? Indeed. Uh, I mean, uh, politicians might say that it's a necessary illusion that people have that these policies are working out because otherwise we shan't be able to, you see, necessary for us, but uh, that it should be necessary for them to be deluded doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. I thought that, that, I mean, that this was, you see, dozen people writing little pieces in New Scientist, taking it for granted that all this is so, um, and uh, then saying, well, uh, unfortunately, it's an illusion, but we can't help it. Now, that seems to be nonsense. <laughs> Isn't it? Have we got time for some more questions? Uh, 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 at the back there, sir. Uh, just concerned that there's a little bit of a kind of whiff of anti-science about this. Um, I mean, if you, clearly there are good and bad scientists, but if you take science at it, what it must be at its purest, which is a commitment to evidential truth, then surely we ought to start from the premise that we are just products of merely brain chemistry, that the self is just brain chemistry, that we are wet computers. So, for example, you can put some, you know, you can say mere emotions. I clearly f feel emotions. If a tiger was there, I would feel frightened. But if you put me in an MRI scanner while that tiger was there, you'll be able to see the, the screen light up. Those emotions are real, but they're purely a product of brain chemistry. You can also see it when people's selves, their personality changes as a result of brain injury, for example. So isn't the burden on yourself, uh, Dr. Midgley, that... Um, 
you know, people who say that there are constructs such as self, emotions, and so on, um, need to say, define particularly what they are. Because my view would be is that, as, a, as a someone committed to evidence and reason, that they are just purely a product of brain chemistry. And I await, with an open mind, if you'll forgive the pun, any evidence that there's anything more than that. Are you being anti-scientific because we are anti-scientific because we are just products of biochemistry? We are, we are as the gentleman said, wet computers. Um, uh, yes, I feel emotions, but if you were to look at my brain in an MRI scan while I'm, that's happening, you will see that this has a, a, a physical, neurological basis, and 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 uh, we shouldn't deny the the the, the these, these material evidence. Uh, and and uh, is, is that yeah? Well. I have positively said, of course there is a physical basis. Of course, if somebody knocks you on the head, you can't go on thinking. This is not in question. But that is not the whole thing. The idea that because your thoughts and feelings are uh, dependent on these brain cells and such, they aren't real is a meaningless thought. Uh, suppose that somebody is uh, put in prison and is very miserable. Their misery is real. It is real misery. It is among the real things in the world. Um, people, uh, people get the idea that nothing's real unless it's physical, meaning unless it can be checked, its existence can be checked by some physical science. None of us lives for half a day on that assumption we are motivated to do what we wish to do because we have real feelings which are real feelings. You see, joys and sorrows are real joys and sorrows. There can be, as it were, illusory ones, people who deceive themselves in a particular way. Um, uh, and they can even deceive the people around them. We know about that. But if you say you can deceive people in that way, you're saying there is a real one, which isn't this one, you see. And as somebody pointed out, if a tiger turns up, uh, it's inclined to happen that the uh, real feelings will emerge, uh, whatever might have been going on before. Yes, I mean, you are just providing me with evidence of how extraordinarily habitual this rather mindless materialism, exclusive materialism, is today. People think it's obvious that nothing except physical things are real. Well, just watch how they live for the next day or so. Uh, you see, um, people say there is nothing in the world except these uh, physical objects. Well, among the things that there are in the world is money, right? Money is not just bits of paper and coins. Money is an immensely complex system with great, great reality. It's real enough. It gets in our way. It is a serious item in the world. And there are a lot of social realities. Yes, John, that American philosopher puts it in this well. John, what's his name? Um, yes, um, you see, social realities are what we largely live by. Um, and if you say, well, behind those social realities, uh, there have to be some physical things. That is, if you take away the money, the person won't be able to eat so much or something of this sort. One, this, is, this is the Napoleon example in, your, in yeah. your book. You're talking, if you want to understand why Napoleon invades Egypt or Russia, yeah. the a sort of readout of the neurological waves yes. isn't going to help you no. as much. What no. might you want to know? I thought that was quite an interesting example. I mean, Napoleon does make these two rather startling invasions, you see. It really is his own idea. Um, did his neurons go out into the world and work out, yes, it should be Russia next, you see? Where would the neurons get all that? The neurons cannot be the source of ideas like that, which are uh, uh, <laughs> socially very large and uh, report facts about the world. We are much more complicated beings than this notion. And I, mean, I think people feel that they ought to boil it all down to the physical stuff because they are getting rid of some superstition or other. Well, of course, they'd better get rid of superstitions, but this stuff is not superstition. It, it's substance of everyday life. Thank you. Uh, gentleman in the front row. Uh, you, you, sir. 
isn't it a question of getting a balance between science and the self? And if I can take a specific example, and that is addiction. Um, addiction to addiction. drugs or alcohol or whatever. I mean, it's 20 years now since the American Medical Association, followed by the British Medical Association, decided that addiction was a disease based on alteration in brain chemistry. And yet, uh, that seems to confuse people, addicts, in treatment, because in a sense, they, well, they don't have any kind of responsibility, personal responsibility. A treatment, although it's diagnosed as a medical condition, the treatment is often behavioral and psychological. So it's really a question of, of uh, the, the, the damage that a diagnosis or a labeling potentially like that can do in denying the part that self and personal responsibility plays. Yes, I could hear that one. Yeah. Yes, yes, very important, yes. I mean, this is a general point about mental illness, or now called mental illness, isn't it? That it has two aspects, it really does. Um, the, quote, subjective medical uh, aspect in which you can look it all up in various literatures, um, and the personal aspect, the person, the, the, what it is for the person themselves and for all those around them. Now, we don't have to choose between these, though we often do in practice have to decide which to emphasize. Um, but it is one of the serious worries of the present day that these are both strong ways of thinking uh, which have somehow to be brought together. And uh, good psychiatrists and good nurses and so on are always going around from one side to the other and saying, have I forgotten something, you see? But this isn't the only place in life where different ways of thinking have both to be used. There's quite a lot of it about. Um, and, and it's one thing that I think is it the job of philosophers to draw attention to when people get stuck by being obsessed with a single way of looking at things, they will just get the telescope rather than the microscope, stand back and see what the neighbours of this are, you know. Um, uh, thank you for bringing it up. It's an absolutely central example. Yeah. Uh, and actually, you mentioned uh, philosophy there. I wondered uh, if there was anything in the way that philosophy, because uh, you've We've criticised the science and, and the arts. Anything that, in the way that philosophy is being taught in universities now that you find troubling or odd? Well, I'm sorry, this is a depressing subject. <laughs> I mean, a lot of philosophy teaching is all right, but there has been an increasingly strong tendency in the last half century or so to narrow the questions, to... Uh, I think it's more professional to uh, get a more detailed question um, and not uh, mention the wider aspects of it. I take I think a lot of the trouble here is due to the custom of uh, graduate students having to do a thesis which they have to defend. They have to choose a subject which is not too big. They've got to try and avoid saying anything obviously wrong. So they are defensive, they narrow it, and they get themselves a speciality. They become the person who uh, wrote about uh, Russell's theory of this and that, um, you see. And um, inevitably, as a result of that, they get uh, unwilling and afraid to look at larger questions. They do tend to view it as un unprofessional to do so. Um, and if you brought back from the grave, uh, you see even quite uh, skeptical people like Hume, they would be shocked, I think, at the sort of syllabuses that they would find. Um, it's not that detailed work isn't important, it is, but that you should direct yourself by looking for what's the largest question that seems to be making difficulties here, that you should look for a, make a, a wider map on which that shown in the context of everything else, uh, seems to me to be a crucial habit, and I don't know how to get it back, I'm afraid, into present-day philosophy teaching. I've just been corresponding a bit with a number of philosophers to find out whether it's true, as I'm told it is in some universities, they don't use 
teach any philosophy earlier than the last 20 years. What? <laughs> yes, right. You see, um, they aren't... Yeah, and a student was asked what he'd read during his undergraduate career. He had read no Descartes, no Aristotle, and no Kant. Well, what Descartes? You know, you can't understand why you are where you are today if you don't bother to read Descartes, and it's easy to read. You see, um, there's a, a tendency to uh, value. It's just what I was saying about happens to scientists, but it's happening to all sorts of subjects, I fear, that the, uh, you see, the, 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 the upper, the more, the grander, the, the, the more respected area is the more detailed area, and people go on and say that's all they need do. What? <laughs> Can I take a, a last question? Yes, sir. Going well Sorry, could you wait for the mic? Thank you. Going well earlier than Descartes, what would you say to Buddha who said that true bliss could only come from realizing you have no self? Going earlier than Descartes, what would yes. you say to Buddha who says that true bliss would only come from realizing that you have no self? Well, I think Buddha has had some often, often very sensible philosophic ideas. What he meant here is, however, a bit different. Um, he was not saying, don't take any notice of your own feelings. Uh, he was actually highly interested in people's feelings, thought them very important. Um, it, what he was objecting to was the idea of a permanent self, substantial self, which would go on uh, through, through many lives uh, unchanged. Um, yes, and it's, I mean, it, I think it's very interesting because, indeed, the people who are selling this uh, no self stuff today do often mention that, um, but it is quite different. You see, what the Buddha's after is stopping you being so obsessed with the fate of this single separate self and making you look at yourself as part of a whole, identify with uh, the body of, of, of all, all the people around and uh, you know, share, share their thoughts, their feelings and so forth. There is no moral message of that kind linked with what Crick is saying. There's no positive uh, direction instead of being interested in yourself. So, I mean, what the Buddha is saying, much closer to the usual objection to the idea of selfishness, which is of exclusiveness, isn't it? Of cut-offness. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm obviously summarizing what's a very complicated doctrine, but there's always a propaganda reason. There's always a reason why people say these things. And to say this particular thing can involve completely different intentions and directions from what they are now using. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, just in concluding, I want to say that, um, uh, as with so many of Mary's books, um, uh, Are You an Illusion? When you read it, you do have a, a powerful sense of your mind uh, uh, rearranging itself geologically. Uh, and also, unlike any other philosopher that I can think of, uh, Mary Midgley includes a limerick, something many of us wish Wittgenstein had, had done more of, and it might have got him out of a lot of <laughs> difficulties. And I, I just want to, to end uh, this session at the RSA, perhaps for the first time at the RSA, in these august halls, by quoting the limerick that Mary cites, uh, um, which is, uh, I believe, goes, there was a faith healer from Deal who said, although pain isn't real, if I sit on a pin and it punctures my skin, I dislike what I fancy I feel. So uh, please, uh, uh, please uh, uh, join with me in, in expressing your uh, uh, appreciation of this wonderful philosopher with whom it has been our great privilege to share the last hour. Mary Midgley.